Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutte Shri Mati Bhaktivedanta Swami Tanamane Namaste Sarasutam Deve Gauravani Bracharane Nirvishesha Shnivadi Askatya Devi Siddharne Are we ready to begin? Is uh, Lavangalata Devidasi here? Agnihotra? Are we ready to begin? Da, da. Okay. Yeah, we'll just wait a couple of minutes and see this. Seems like more devotees are coming. Okay. Я на русском канале, я вас слышу. I'll begin. With, so today we're going to read from the Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter nine, the most confidential knowledge, text number two. Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam, Devitrami Damutamam, Pravaksham Dharm, Pravakshad Vargamam Dharmam, Susukam Kartum Aviyam. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge because it gives the re- direct perception of the self by realization. It is the perfection of religion, it is everlasting, and it is joyfully performed. I'm not going to read the whole purport. This is one of the longest purports in the entire Bhagavad Gita. It would probably take me at least half the time just to read the purport. So I'll just read a couple of paragraphs. This chapter of Bhagavad Gita is called The King of Education because it is the essence of all doctrines and philosophies explained before. Among the principal philosophers in India, are Gautama, Kanada, Kapila, Yagavalka, Sandila, and Vaishvanara. And finally, there is Vyasadeva, the author of the Vedanta Sutra. So there is no dearth of knowledge in the field of philosophy or transcendental knowledge. Now the Lord says that this ninth chapter is the king of all such knowledge. The essence of all knowledge that can be derived from the study of the Vedas and different kinds of philosophy. It is the most confidential because confidential or transcendental knowledge involves understanding the difference between the soul and the body. And the king of all confidential knowledge culminates in devotional service. Generally, people are not educated in this confidential knowledge. They're educated in external knowledge. As far as ordinary education is concerned, people are involved with so many departments of politics, sociology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, engineering, etc. There are so many departments of knowledge all over the world and many huge universities. But there is unfortunately no university or educational institution where the science of the spirit soul is instructed. Yet the soul is the most important part of the body. Without the presence of the soul, the body has no value. Still, people are placing great stress on the bodily necessities of life, not caring for the vital soul. Bhagavad Gita, especially from the second chapter on, stresses the importance of the soul. In the very beginning, the Lord says that this body is perishable and that the soul is not perishable. Antavanta ime deha nityas yokta sharirina. That is a confidential part of knowledge. Simply knowing that the spirit soul is different from this body 
that its nature is immutable, indestructible, and eternal. But that gives no positive information about the soul. Sometimes people are under the impression that the soul is different from the body and that when the body is finished or when one is liberated from the body, the soul remains in a void and becomes impersonal. But actually that is not a fact. How can the soul, which is so active within this body, be inactive after being liberated from the body? It is always active. If it is eternal, then it is eternally active and its activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of the spiritual knowledge. These activities of the spirit soul are therefore indicated here as con constituting the king of all knowledge, the most confidential part of all knowledge. Mom Vishnu Brahma Krishna Prasthai Buddha, Srimadhi Bhaktivedanta Swami Tanamane, Namaste Saraswatunde, Gauravani Bhacharane, Nirvishesha Shunivari, Haskadyade Siddharane. The middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita from the seventh chapter up until the twelfth chapter are considered to be the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is a book which is meant to convince us, or was spoken by Krishna to Arjuna, in order to convince us that we're eternally Krishna's servants, and that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Otherwise, there is no real benefit from reading Bhagavad Gita, as Prabhupada explains, if we don't at least theoretically accept that Krishna is God, the Supreme Person. And because he's God, therefore, as he says in Bhagavad Gita, Vedanam samapitani vartmanarni cha arjuna pravishami to bhutani mam tu vedanakastana. As the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know everything that has happened in the past, everything that's happening in the present, and all things that are going to happen in the future. I know everyone, but me, no one knows. Now, Krishna knows everything in the past, present, and future. Therefore, he's certainly the best person to give knowledge. And according to Krishna in this verse, that the king of all knowledge is to understand one's relationship with Krishna. There are two kinds of souls. There is the Nitya Mukta, one who is always liberated eternally and the nukta bandha, bada, the soul who's conditioned by the material energy. Conditioned by the material energy means that the soul is subjected to the laws of material nature, of which one of the, some of the laws of material nature is that the soul has to transmigrate from one body to another. Just as we can see by our personal experience that Whatever, in spite of the fact that we'd like to stay young forever in this body, but whatever our desires may be in that regard, the body is constantly changing. And for most of us, we have to admit, it's really not getting any younger. Generally speaking, most of us get older as time goes on. Although we're uh, we don't appreciate that, that's because we're all eternal. In the spiritual world, no one grows older. And even if you're so-called old in the spiritual world, still you feel like you're young because you have a spiritual body, which is full of bliss, full of knowledge and eternal. But here we're subjected to, to birth, death, old age and disease, which is quite uncomfortable. That's called conditioned life. Although in the material world, as Prabhupada mentions, that there are many different educational institutions offering a wide variety of subjects from physics to chemistry, to psychology, to biology, 
but there's no institution, generally speaking, which can actually offer the king of knowledge. That is how to get free from old age, disease, and death, which are our actual problems. They may superficially offer some relief, temporary relief, if at all, but they can't really solve the problem, the fact that we have to leave this body sooner or maybe a little later. Therefore, Krishna calls this the king of all knowledge because it's the only knowledge that will solve all the problems that we have. Our main problem is that we think or we identify ourselves with this body and therefore we think that this, the senses are the only object of our service. And of course, things that are related to our body, we also serve them, but because, only because they're related to our body in some way, whether it be our family or our, our country, whatever it may be. But the basic principle is either we're personally satisfying our own senses or with satisfying the senses of others. But no matter how much we serve our own senses or how much we serve other people's senses, the real problems of life, namely birth, death, old age and disease remain unsolved. So Krishna, he gives a simple formula that this knowledge is about the soul and the Supreme Lord. We don't need so much other knowledge. Modern society, as I pointed out before, has made everything very, very complicated. Prabhupada said, all we need is the little land and the cow and our economic problems are solved. But modern society has made it ex extensive, a very, very complicated, even to survive in this body. Now, as we can see from our practical experience, a bird doesn't have to go to college for five years or 15 years in order to learn how to get a worm. Nor does a pig have to learn how to, what the dietary requirements he has are by going to a university and finding out what the proper diet for a pig is. Nor does the pig have to take psychology 101, 102 to find out how to relate to the sheep pig. But human beings have made everything very complicated and therefore there's millions and millions of books all describing how to somehow or another maintain this body in a very comfortable way. And the mind peaceful. But there's no knowledge to actually solve all the problems. There's a lot of knowledge to make everything complicated, but to solve everything, all the problems to get free from our bodily identification. And instead, Krishna, Surya, Sama, Maya, Haya, Andhakar. If one becomes conscious of Krishna, then one realizes uh, eternality. One realizes that one is eternal and therefore there's no more fear. The main suffering we experience in the material world is fear. Because we don't know where we're going. After we leave this body, we don't know where our next destination is. And therefore we're always fearful what the future may hold. Everyone would like to find out from their astrological chart when they're going to become rich and famous, when they're going to have a wonderful family, when all their enemies will be vanquished. But where is the astrologer telling us what our next birth is going to be? They may guess, just like they may guess what, what happened in our last lifetime, but no one really knows. And especially we don't know. And because we don't know, therefore we're always in anxiety about what the future holds. Not the immediate future. Today is Sunday, so perhaps if we're in a temple, there may be some opportunity for the Sunday feast. 
So I can predict that every Sunday, if you're in such a temple, there'll be a Sunday feast. So I can predict the future. But where are you, which Sunday, where are you going to be during the Sunday feast in a hundred years from now? That I cannot predict. Hopefully you'll be at some Sunday feast somewhere or some feast maybe in Goloka Vrindavan. Therefore this knowledge given by the Supreme Lord who knows everything past, present, and future is most valuable. And he makes it very simple that this knowledge is not only the most king of knowledge, but it's the purest knowledge. Because by such knowledge, one can actually become purified of our, all our misgivings, all our misconceptions. That if we hear this knowledge and then we apply it, then Krishna says, the Dhami Buddha Yogam Tam. Then Krishna himself personally will give us the intelligence to understand what this knowledge is about. Now we go to university, I don't think there's any professor at a university who can claim that if you try to study this knowledge, then the professor will appear in your heart and give you the intelligence by which you can understand it. The original professor, Krishna, he can give us intelligence how to understand something, but an ordinary professor, no. So Krishna says that this is the purest knowledge because one who hears this knowledge becomes purified and one who engages in devotional service, which is what this knowledge is all about, in order to become conscious of Krishna, then one, by Krishna's mercy, by Krishna's revelation, then we become purified. It doesn't matter if we were impure, but by hearing this knowledge and applying it within our life, then one, by Krishna's arrangement, by Krishna's mercy, we become purified of all misconceptions. There is no other way. By scholastic study, one will not realize one's, one is eternal. Nor one will realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead just by theoretically studying about God at a university. One has to apply oneself to the practice of devotional service. And therefore, Krishna says, this is the most confidential knowledge. It's not only the confidential knowledge, Raja Vidya, it's the, high, the king of knowledge, but Raja Guyam, it's the most confidential knowledge because most people are not interested in such knowledge. If I was giving a class on how to eat better, how to sleep better, how to mate better, and how to defend better, then if I was expert at those things, then naturally people would be very inquisitive that this knowledge is quite valuable. But if we're giving a knowledge about God and service to him, the audience becomes smaller because most people are not interested in such knowledge, at least so far. Therefore, it's called the most confidential knowledge because even we go out and we scream this knowledge out in public, no one will take it seriously. They won't understand anything we're saying. Therefore, it's very confidential. As Krishna Das Kavaraj says in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I'm giving the most confidential knowledge about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes and even the relation between Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. So this shouldn't be done because people are like hogs and dogs and camels and asses. Uh, they will not appreciate this knowledge. As a matter of fact, they'll, they'll, they'll deride this knowledge. They'll think it's actually sentiment or they think it's imagination. However they may think. So Shouldn't I be concerned? Krishna Kavaraj Goswami asks about this, about my revealing such knowledge to people who are unqualified. But he said, actually, there's no problem. Because even I write down the most intimate knowledge about Krishna and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, people will not be able to understand it anyhow. They'll still be, simply remain confidential because they won't take to the process of pure devotional service. 
For those who do take to the process of pure devotional service, then the most secret of all secrets will be revealed to them by Krishna's arrangement, by Krishna's mercy. So we don't have to do a whole lot of things. We don't have to get our doctorate at a university. We don't have to lift weights every day. We don't have to run a marathon. But we do have to hear about Krishna. And we do try to have to understand, try to remember what was said. Because otherwise, remember, as I said many times, unless we remember what was said, <laughs> how could we possibly apply it during the day? During the day, we're thinking, I, I know there was something from the class I was supposed to remember, but I can't remember what the book was that they read from. I think it was something about Krishna, but I'm not so sure. And I'm pretty sure it was, I think it was the Shumad Bhagavatam, but I have no idea which canto it was. But there was something important I was supposed to remember. If we could remember one thing from a class and remember it during the day, then our attending the class was successful. It actually had some meaning. But at the end of the class, we can't even remember which book it was. Then it's very difficult to actually apply it within our lives. So if we do remember it, what was being said, then we have to try and see what was said. It's not enough to remember. We can invite a flock of parrots in Vrindavan there. If you go to a certain place in Vrindavan during a certain part of the day, there are literally tens and thousands of parrots. They congregate. Maybe to hear Shema Bhagavatam, I don't know. But they can't, you can go there and you see the, all these a whole fields full of parrots. And we could teach them Shema Bhagavatam. We can have a, a spontaneous Bhagavatam class, get all the parrots, re, repeat the purse. And undoubtedly, if they're good parrots, <laughs> within 10 minutes they'll all be repeating the verse perfectly even without the book <laughs> we can't even teach them the Sanskrit the word for word maybe even the purport but if you ask a parrot could you please explain the verse how it, what it means to your life the parrot will look like you're, like you're crazy My job is not to understand what I, what I heard, it's just to repeat what I heard. So we not only have to hear and remember what we heard, no, that's why Shri Vyasadeva wrote these books down. He didn't write them down because he was living in the Himalayas and he didn't have a job. So he was suffering because without a job, he couldn't buy anything at the store. So he figured if I become a famous author, that even if I can't print the books here, but in the future, my followers will be able to print these books and sell them on the street and get enough money so they can eat. That's not exactly why Shula Vyasadeva wrote these books. He himself had heard the books, but he knew and he had remembered them. But he knew that the age of Kali was coming and therefore it was necessary to write them down because what to speak of remembering what's in the book, we can't remember where we put the book. And if we can find the book, then we could try to go over it enough time so that we can remember what we actually heard. Now, after hearing it and remembering it, then we have to look around and see what it means. We don't necessarily have to look around, but we have to think about what it actually practically means in my life. Just like it says that every Krishna says, Rasoham Apsnukondiya. How often during the day when we drink water, we remember that the taste of this water is Krishna. 
Now we may not be a great philosopher. We may not memorize Bhagavad Gita backwards and forward. But if we could actually remember that at least when we take water, that the taste of the water is Krishna, Prabhupada said, then we'll become a great devotee. Prabhupada even said in one lecture that if a drunkard, he drinks wine, and when, while he's drinking the wine, he thinks that Krishna is the taste in the wine. That by doing so one day, Prabhupada said, the drunkard will become a devotee just by constantly remembering Krishna. One time, Vishnu John Maharaj, he was a temple president in a little temple in Austin, Texas. And he had several devotees there, or some devotees there. And he wrote Srila Prabhupada a letter. And in the letter, he asked Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, my Devotees in this temple, the devotees in this temple, they only want to eat prasadam. They don't want to do anything else. Is that all right? So Prabhupada wrote back, he said, that's okay. But in between bites, they should chant Hare Krishna. So this knowledge is actually quite simple. And if we engage in it by hearing about it and then remembering it and then try to see it, how it applies to my life. So that when I take water, I remember that the taste is water. When I look at this sky, if you can see the sun, you remember that the Krishna, Krishna is the light and the sun and the moon. And if we remember that Krishna is the ability of man, then we won't be envious of if we're not envious of Krishna, we won't be envious of other people who have talent. Because we'll realize that their talent is being given by Krishna. One time, Sri Prabhupada was on an airplane with some of his disciples, and there was a movie playing. And the movie was about Charlie Chaplin, if you know who Charlie Chaplin was. It was, he was a famous actor during the time when there was silent movies. And Prabhupada watched the whole movie, laughing and very happy to watch the movie. So does that mean that we should all watch movies? <laughs> Prabhupada watched the movie. Does that mean we should all watch? No, when Prabhupada was watching the movie, he was seeing it probably from a undoubtedly from a different perspective than we're seeing the movie. Because he was seeing the Charlie Chaplin, as he explained sometime, that he was so he that talent that Charlie Chaplin had was actually coming from Krishna. It was a manifestation of Krishna's opulence. So a pure devotee, generally speaking, he sees everyone and everything in relationship to Krishna. And therefore, he never forgets Krishna. But if we say certain things, then instead of remembering Krishna, we'll remember our past activities. Therefore, Yadavadi Mama Krishna, Yadavadi Nana, Yadavadi Mama Krishna, Chaita Ravinde, Nava Nava Rasa Daman Yujitam Rantum Asi. So a great devotee, Jamunacharya, said that now that I'm always remembering the pastimes of Krishna and feeling ever greater pleasure by doing so, now whenever I think of my past activities and sense gratification, I become disgusted by them. If one is actually fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, then one will not be attracted by other things, as if something else ha can give one more pleasure than Christian consciousness. And even one sees things in, in, in the material world, everything one sees, as it says, a pure devotee, wherever he looks, he only sees Krishna.
So we can't imitate a pure devotee, but we can try to understand according to our level, what we have to do to actually always remember Krishna and never forget him. And not, as it says, bhakti pareshanu vyaktir, anyatratrika ekakala. That is, there are certain symptoms of pure devotional service. One of them is that it helps one develop feelings and affection for Krishna and for everyone and everything in relation to Krishna. And at the same time, it helps us see everything and everyone in relation to Krishna. And it gives us the spiritual strength that things that would normally distract us from our service to Krishna, we become disinterested in them. Just like when one eats a meal, with every bite, there's growing strength, there is satisfaction, and there's alleviation from hunger. And therefore this knowledge, because it gives direct perception of Krishna by realization, gives one complete satisfaction. Therefore Prabhupada writes here, that this is the perfection of religion. Religion is not meant to be just a sentimental designation. The basic principle of religion, as we all know, are to stop unrestricted. The first principle of religion is to stop unrestricted sense gratification. All religious principles in the beginning, when one is in the conditioned life, are meant to regulate the senses. The conditioned soul is in the material world because he is attracted or averse by the objects of his experience here. And, and therefore, the material nature is always bewildering the soul and with duality, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor, dishonor, male and female, et cetera, et cetera. But religion is meant to regulate our minds and our senses so that we don't feel undue attraction or aversion to things of this world. Instead, we see them in relation to Krishna. So it's not because we become completely indifferent to everything. It's not that we, you know, we, we bump into a tree or we bump into a man or bump into a woman, it's all the same. We're not becoming impersonalists. We give prashadam to human beings. We offer obeisances to human beings. We don't offer obeisances to trees or to tigers. So it's not that we lose all perce perception, but we see how the tiger, within the heart of the tiger, in the heart of the tree, there's a soul and the super soul. So for the tree, we may take the apple from the tree and offer it to Krishna. And for the tiger, we may throw them some prasada when no one's looking. But we have different feelings with different living entities according to what's appropriate to help them understand Krishna and engage in Krishna's service. So the perfection of religion goes beyond just the four regular principles. That is, generally speaking, people think that religion means to restrict himself some way from sense gratification. And at the same time, pray to God that God bestows all blessings for more sense gratification. For instance, there's religions that restrict one from killing children, but they don't restrict one from killing animals. There's some re religions that forbid intoxication, but they don't forbid also killing animals. 
or illicit sex life. Therefore, the real religion cannot be perfected unless one actually understands who God is. Unless one un understands the goal, then one will, uh, that Krishna is the most attractive person, is the most loving person, and that we have an eternal relationship with him, whether we're conscious of it or not, that relationship will go on eternally. If we're conscious of the source of pleasure and the person who can expand our consciousness to experience unlimited love and unlimited happiness, if we become conscious that Krishna is that person who's in our heart, it's not that the Hare Krishna movement is creating a Krishna and telling people to put this Krishna in your heart. Krishna's already there. And when we understand Krishna and we apply ourselves to his service and we try to see how things are related to Krishna, then we'll become more perfect in religion. Then we'll see the animals not as an object of our exploitation or other people as the object of our exploitation. And therefore we can stop we can further advance religious principles by acting piously. The, the only possibility of really being pious is either by fully engaging in Christian service or living simply. As I've said before, as Prabhupada said repeatedly, the culture, our culture is that when we actually get a higher taste, when we're happy in Christian consciousness, then we don't have, and we're happy in our relationships, we don't have to fall in love with our smartphone. People nowadays, they're in love with their smartphone, but they don't like the members of their family. Matter of fact, even I was told sometimes people who sit at the same table eating supper with each other, the same members of the family, instead of talking to each other during supper, they're te texting each other. So that's a little extreme. People are in different rooms, the same house, different rooms. They don't go get up and talk to each other. They call each other on the phone or text each other. This is called progress. So-called progress. But actually in the Vedic culture, where you have a cow, you have some land, and you're growing your vegetables and you're providing for, you build your own house, then everyone in the family becomes useful. There's no unemployment. There's no anxiety over getting fired. Cow won't fire you from milking it. It's not that one day the cow says, I'm tired of you milking me. I'm going on strike. You're fired. The grains won't say, sorry, you're not allowed to, to, to harvest me this year. Hands off. No, if one is actually living off the land, then there's no unemployment. And even the children become useful. They can actually take care of the, the animals on the farm. They can actually help in the harvesting. They can help in the mother pre prepare things in the kitchen or clean. The children become useful. They're not little, you know, hobbies, expensive hobbies that people, that parents have as an expensive hobby. They're actually useful to the society. They don't have to be brainwashed, you know, in such a way as they spend their whole life as if the whole world is just a little, is a big video game. They play their whole life, they spend their whole life killing things on their little computer, the little phone, and then they grow up, then they graduate to join the army and kill real people in their video, video games. And this is called progress. 
But if people are living simply off the land, then everyone becomes useful, everyone's mind becomes peaceful, everyone is appreciating each other for their work that they're doing, there's more of an opportunity to cooperate, less of an opportunity, need for exploitation. There's no need for drilling into the earth to get oil and then transporting the oil by huge boats across oceans, bring them to refineries then to gas stations, then building trucks and automobiles, and then in order to transport this oil so that people can heat, heat their houses with it and till the, uh, till the land and harvest the land, drive to the store in order to get the, the products from the, the factory, which have destroyed all the nutrients of the food. And by the time people sit down and eat it, they're full of anxiety, whether they, they're going to have enough money to, tomorrow to buy the popcorn. So such a civilization, which has made everything complicated, has actually distracted people from the actual goal of life. That if people live simply, and of course, if they work, Krishna forbid that any of us really would ever have to work. <laughs> that if people actually work, they actually become healthy. They can actually digest the food. Not that they eat huge quantities of useless food, and they don't do anything. They just watch the news, all the bad news, about how there's going to be a food shortage next week. And they're just full of anxiety. So simple living and high thinking. Simple living, maintaining oneself by living from the land and chanting his holy names. Uh, that's the ideal situation. Although we may not be able immediately to manifest such a economic system, but we should appreciate it at least. Otherwise, where is there any, any possibility of, of at least going in that direction in the future? And if one lives simply and chants the holy name, then one will be able to tolerate one's mind. All the ups and downs of material existence, one will be able to tolerate because one is rely upon Krishna, not only for the remembering Krishna, but Krishna will supply the air, the rain, and everything necessary for the production of food. And if Krishna doesn't supply, then what else can you do? So one will be able to tolerate the demands, of the unnecessary demands of the senses, the speculations of the mind. And if one can tolerate such material conceptions and material feelings and whatever else, then one can actually think about Krishna peacefully. And by thinking about Krishna peacefully and experiencing Krishna, one can be happy simply in Krishna consciousness. The less worries we have, the less anxieties we have, the less reason for anxiety and worries we have, then the more we can chant Hare Krishna peacefully. And if we chant Hare Krishna peacefully, with some feeling and attention, then Krishna becomes pleased and he manifests himself in our memories. And by feeling Krishna's presence, we become ecstatic. And in such ecstasy, we can understand Krishna more clearly. Every Krishna reveals himself and therefore we can understand everyone and everything in relationship to Krishna. And everyone and everything becomes just as, as becomes attractive like Krishna is attractive. Then one will eventually concentrate the mind upon Krishna and live with Krishna always and be able to meditate and trance upon Krishna in pure love of Krishna. So of course, this is called, this is the perfection of religion to actually fall in love with Krishna. That's the goal of all religions. That's the goal of all activities. And if one does that, then one will be with Krishna forever. And everything will become more and more exciting, more and more wonderful forever. And therefore, we should do devotional service joyfully, 
because we're, devotional service is the most auspicious activity. It can't be anything comparable to devotional service. And one does devotional service, then one's actual spiritual life, as we, is revived, uh, will understand that this is real success in life. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. I have a question. I write this question in uh, chat Zoom. Okay. Why in our times people who take care of cows are not prosperous? How taking care of cows changes the life of a person to the better? Who wrote the, who asked the question? You don't have to say, but I just, yeah. what's that? You asked it. What, what do you mean by prosperous? What, what is your definition of prosperous? Agnihotra? So it is not just, so it is not just prosperous. Um, normal life that uh, children uh, have uh, clothes, uh, uh, normal house, not very big, but normal house and another. But I see that uh, often uh, devotees who take care about cows is poor, have poor, poor life. Poor life? You mean they don't have a house? It, uh, yes, no mean, house. This is very simple and hard life, I think. Hard life. So people who don't take care of cows, they have an easy life. You live in the Ukraine, right? Most people don't take care of cows. Panimaish? Agnihotra? Slushi? Yeah. So people live yes. in modern society, they have an easy life. They're working 40 hours a week minimum. And then sometimes they have to have another job besides them in order to maintain the house. Matter of fact, they hardly ever have time to be in the house because they're working in order to maintain it. So is that an easy life? They come back after working at their job they sit down on their couch, get a can of beer, drink it while they're watching some game where two sides are trying to kill each other. Then they eat some dead animal and they go to sleep intoxicated, wake up distressed and they get into their car or however, wherever they go to work to go to some meaningless job where the boss is yelling at them. And this is called an easy life. Is that a definition of an easy life? Always in afraid, if they don't do the right thing, they'll get fired. Nowadays, if you don't take the vaccine, you, you become unemployed, you can't eat. No, the cow, if you have a cow, the cow will never ask you to take a vaccine in order to in, in, be employed with her. The cow makes very little stipulations what you have to do. Now, taking care of a cow doesn't usually mean 24 hours a day. The cow, generally speaking, if you have a little land, the cow can go out and graze on the land. And you just have to spend some time with the cow milking it or whatever else. Now, in the rest of the time, why, if people are educated, why can't they build their own house? You can build a very comfortable house. If you go on the internet for very little money, they can tell you how to utilize the wood or other kinds of things that are available and build very nice houses for practically nothing. Why has it become so complicated? to get a house. 
and wise if you're taking care of cows, whoever, it has to be, you know, 24 hours a day. You have so much time to build a house. And when you build a house, you don't have to build a house every day. Once you have a house, then that lasts for years and years. And you don't have to pay the mortgage. If you build your own house, if you have a little land, you build your own house, you don't have to pay a mortgage. You don't have to pay for the electricity. You don't even have to pay for the heating. You may have to chop a little wood sometimes, but that's it. Maybe once dig a well or something, but self-sufficiency doesn't mean that you don't get water, you don't have air, you don't have food, you don't have a house. These things are not so difficult. I was seeing on, on the internet, people build houses for like, you know, 10,000 euros or something. And they have a very comfortable house that will last for 40 years. They don't have to pay any rent on it, a mortgage. The, rep the, the repairs are very simple. And it only took them, you know, it didn't take them forever to build a house. Previously, people had this knowledge, and when someone would have to build a house in their community, everyone would get together and they'd build a house together. So you had the company of so many neighbors. You actually knew who your neighbors were because we were all working together. Not that someone's living next to you for 40 years and you don't even know who it is. All you do is hear them screaming. So I don't know how, what you mean by poor. They have not, if you have knowledge about Krishna and you get the basic necessities of life, you have a place to sleep, you have some heat in the winter, you have some fresh air and clean water, that's really opulence. That's really wealth. Not that I'm living in a city on 120th floor of some apartment building. All I'm doing is hearing the noise from my neighbors. There's no fresh air because you can't open the window. The water is, you know, coming from pipes that were, you know, 200 years old, full of chlorine, fluorine. The food is full of pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, and people sides. And I think I'm prosperous because I have some number in the bank with some figure in the bank. I can't eat properly. I can't breathe the air. I can't sleep at night, but I think I'm wealthy. So that's called poverty stricken. One time Tariqa Maharaj was, Prabhupada was staying at the uh, Tittenhurst where John Lennon was. John Lennon had just bought this mansion or this, where he was living, which had a lot of land on it. And he invited the devotees to come in 1969 to live there and to help fix up the place for himself. So Prabhupada was talking to uh, Trivikram Maharaj was talking to Srila Prabhupada, saying, isn't it wonderful that this man, George Lennon, he has so much money, 300 million pounds. So Prabhupada's answer, what's the, what's the use of all his money? He doesn't know how to use it. You have 300 million pounds, but you're eating dead animals for, for, for lunch. What is the value of such misusing of money? So now you're, you have 300 billion million pounds, you're eating some dead animal. And the next life, you'll have 300 million pounds when you become a rhinoceros or something. Therefore, real opulence is knowledge. Without knowledge, there is no opulence. Okay, please. Yeah. Without knowledge, we don't know how to utilize whatever resources we have. And if we have real knowledge, we're actually in Krishna consciousness, then we can be satisfied with clean air. Nowadays, people, they don't like clean air. It, there's no... 
they can't smell it. <laughs> Probably gives the example, there was one fisherman and wherever he went, he had to take a dead fish with him because unless he smelled fish, he couldn't sleep at night. <laughs> so we've become so used to, to this air with all these chemicals. <laughs> if we breathe free, fresh air, we can't tolerate it. People who live in the city are so much used to so much noise. If they go into the country where it's peaceful, and there's no noise, they can't sleep at night because there's no noise. They get distracted by the peace. So what is the value of such as which so so-called material opulence? If one is Krishna conscious, then one will be satisfied under many different circumstances. And if one is not Krishna conscious, one will not be satisfied under, under any circumstance. Still, if one has a cow, it's not just a cow. One also has to think, now I have a cow and everything is perfect. No, we also have to know how to build houses. We have to know how to build, get wells. We have to know how to get fresh air, clean water. We have to know how to have proper relationships, devotional relationships. It's not just a cow that solves all the problems. But if we have a cow, it solves at least some of the problems. Yudhisthira Maharaj, who is the emperor of the world, a much bigger world than we have now. At night, he, used to, he, could, he went into the barn and slept with the cows. Because if you sleep with cows, it's, it's very healthy and it's very peaceful. So he's the emperor of the world, and he's sleeping with the cows. And we're, what are we sleeping in? We're, we're sleeping in buildings just vibrating with all kinds of things, electricity, Wi-Fi. We're getting zapped at every moment. And we think this is all opulence. We think, oh, how primitive people are living such a peaceful life. Their minds aren't even agitated. What can they possibly be doing? How can they possibly be happy without a completely agitated mind? But when the mind becomes peaceful, then we, we put Krishna there. Or even if it's not peaceful, we try to put Krishna there anyhow. But it's a lot easier when the mind's peaceful. Then we can actually understand what real happiness is, what, what real knowledge is, what real peace is. Anything else? Yes. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj, for your answer. Uh, Guru Maharaj, in chat, uh, we have some yellow Diana hand. Prabhu has a question. Who's that with the yellow hand? Someone's raising their hand. Yeah. Do you have a question? Okay. Jana, Jana Das, did you have a question? Hare, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, my question is how to become fearless. Realize Krishna and our relationship with him. Every attempt we have to perform devotional service to please Krishna brings us a little closer to fearlessness. When the sun comes up, then all the fears we have about the darkness go away. So because we're in dark darkness now, we're fearful. But when the sun comes up and we see everything and everyone in relation to Krishna, and we find out that Krishna is wonderful and everything he does is perfect, then we will have no more fear. So fear, fearfulness is only due to our lack of Krishna consciousness. And there's no other remedy to become fearless other than to become Krishna conscious. I have a question, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, we often hear that uh, Srila Prabhupada even said, I don't know if you agree with that. I heard Shruta uh, Harisari Prabhu 
uh, that even you should eat meat for sankirt for preaching and uh, all this like Putin preaching. And we know that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj even cooked kitchari for his devotees on Ikadashi for preaching. So when do we apply it? Like we know that we are very much afraid to do this. Thing, so good. I'm glad that you're afraid to do it because if you don't know how to apply it, you shouldn't apply. It. Only the acharya, only one who knows is what how to apply these things should apply them. But it wasn't an ordinary activity for cooking meat. It was just something that, if there's if there's nothing else, if it's clearly in Krishna's service and there's no other alternative, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and when it's completely clear, then one may do things. But that's meant for the liberated souls not for the souls who are still bewildered by the illusory energy. Because if they do something without proper authorization, either from the super soul or from someone who's actually self-realized, then they'll always be doubtful about what they're doing, whether actually Krishna wants that. And if we're doubtful, then it's not within the, the realm of devotional service. We have to become clear what Krishna wants before we do it. Otherwise, then why are we doing it? Krishna says, in all activities depend upon me, work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. If you become conscious of me, then you'll pass over all the obstacles of conditioned life by my grace. If, however, you act without hearing me, but through false ego, then you'll be lost. So we can hear clearly Krishna what he's saying, and we just act, then it will be from false ego, at least partially. And therefore, it will not help us advance in devotional service. Therefore, we don't imitate the acharyas. We follow their instructions. All right. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. We look forward to seeing you again. Shri Prabhupada Kijai. Grantaraj